So, gratitude. It's easy to relate to gratitude as sort of like a needlepoint sampler on the wall, be grateful, or a kind of Hallmark card, oh, I'm thankful for you, yeah, it's nice. But in fact, gratitude can be a profound spiritual practice and also a major aid for resilience and healing in everyday life. Uh, Robert Emmons, who's a professor of psychology at UC Davis, University of California, Davis, pioneered research on gratitude some years ago, Emmons spelled E-M-M-O-N-S. I think one of his first books was Give Thanks. And his research has shown the ways in which practices of authentic gratitude, not slapping lipstick on the pig of life, <laughs> but what you're really grateful for, um, that feels really beneficial and good for you. Authentic gratitude really helps people bounce back from difficulties, helps them process in a genuine way, um, grieving and mourning even over multiple years. Uh, gratitude helps people take a wider view, see the bigger picture, and frankly, be less arrogant, less self-centered because the inherent nature of gratitude is about what we've received, right? I'm glad that, you know, people, I don't know, pay my bill. You know, if they owe me some money, they pay me some money. Fine. You know, there's an exchange there. We're glad about it. But it's not so much that we're grateful for it. We're grateful for gifts. We're grateful for what's given to us, which opens us up to recognize so many things we're grateful for. And that process of recognizing what we've been given, so many things we've been given, that we did not make ourselves. To be able to face that takes a certain humility. It knocks a certain cockiness and self-centeredness off our shoulders, and it turns us toward an honest recognition of the ways in which our life depends upon 10,000 gifts, thousands, countless gifts from other beings every day. Um, and, and certainly throughout history. And that can be hard. So there's a kind of thing you have to move through sometimes to be really grateful. So I want to name that from the get-go, these, these basic aspects of gratitude. It's about receptivity. It's about receiving the gift. And it's about a natural response that appreciates the gift. That natural response of appreciation is not naive or deluded. Alongside the gift here, we can also recognize maybe the mistreatment there or the ways in which the other person or situation is not giving us anything. Okay, and we can even recognize things that are problematic while still appreciating some of what we've been given. So that's kind of foundational about gratitude. And I now wanna talk about um, conventional kinds of gratitude and then really open it up into what I think is a profound opportunity and a very pleasurable one, a very enjoyable one for really freeing the, you know, the mind and opening the heart. So that's kind of my plan here. Uh, then I'll you know, respond to things I see in the chat. I'll also uh, hopefully have a chance to talk with one or two of you at least. So in terms of conventional gratitude, naming certain things we can be grateful for. I covered a number of things during the meditation, and you can look back at that and be aware of what I talked about. Pretty obvious things. Uh, the gift of life, you know, of plants and animals well, that we consume in order to keep on living. Uh, the, the plants that give us the air to breathe, the oxygen certainly in the air we breathe. Uh, we can also be grateful for people past and present, you know, who've opened doors for us. Sometimes I think about uh, people who hardly knew probably what they were doing for me at the time, but a comment or a listening or just directing me to an opportunity or putting a good word in for me, whew, totally changed the course of my life. Absolutely changed the course of my life. And one of the nice benefits of focusing on what we're grateful for in our receiving is it can help make us clearer about and prioritize 
ways in which we can give to others that are often very low cost or no cost at all. A smile, an encouraging word, a sigh of commiseration and compassion, mentioning a possibility. Um, we can really help other people in all kinds of ways that we hardly even think about. Okay, so talked about those things. Also talked about certainly non-human animals, pets, uh, you know, just moments we've had that were just uncanny where we had an encounter with the wild in some regard. I also added for those for whom it's meaningful, and I'm not trying to push it, but for many people, it's really quite meaningful, a sense of gratitude for mystery or what for some it doesn't feel mysterious at all for, for spirits or forces or beings or energies or guides of one kind or another. Um, I had someone write me recently who described a very profound experience uh, in which they, um, in a meditation, dropped into a sense of completely peaceful, contented presence, resting as presence, and voices spoke to them say, saying essentially, hello, hello, what took you so long? I've had experiences like that too. And um, so we can be grateful for that if that's meaningful for you. Okay. Additionally, I want to mention some other things that might be particularly meaningful for you. One is to appreciate uh, teachers that we've had. In our tradition here, Wednesday meditation, which is Buddhisty, uh, you know, one of the classic appreciations is for the Buddha as a teacher and also the Buddha as the inner teacher, the inner teacher that's inherent in all of us as the inherent capacity for wakefulness. Can you be gra grateful for that? And gratitude is, is an important aspect of practice. It's a factor of practice because it turns us toward what is wholesome and beneficial and opens us to the influence of what is wholesome and beneficial that we're grateful for, such as the inner principle and power of wakefulness or the historical teacher. And we can turn to and appreciate teachers as I do from all kinds of traditions, theistic and not theistic around the world. Uh, science, I really appreciate all these people who labored away to try to figure stuff out, and, you know, on, on whose shoulders we stand today. And, you know, you can be grateful for that. Who've been important teachers in your life? Perhaps historical figures no longer alive or key people along the way. I look back at easily half a dozen, maybe more people I could name going back into my late teens in college, uh, 17 in college, really young in college, and incredible teachers I had along the way. Who are your teachers? Another thing we can be grateful for are streams of wisdom, bodies of wisdom, good know-how, practical wisdom, uh, laid out maybe in a coherent way, such as in the in the Dharma, you know, the teachings of in Buddhism, maybe in other traditions as well. Uh, psychology for me has tremendously useful practical wisdom in it. Uh, psychology as a science pretty much didn't exist until toward the end of the 1800s. And clinical psychology really began to develop only in the last century or so. A lot of useful knowledge there that we can draw upon. Well, can you have gratitude for teachings? And also gratitude for community. Gratitude for the community of the taught. Uh, different kinds of communities, congregations, sanghas, teams, buddies, um, I belong to a community of rock climbers, and it's a ragtag <laughs> mob <laughs> in a lot of ways. <laughs> um, and I'm glad about it. I'm really glad about it. I, I take I take refuge in that particular community. Uh, I won't go into details, but about myself. But you know, you can take refuge in communities that, for you, share your values, maybe politically. Uh, 
Yeah, that too might be a bit of a ragtag mob, but still, it's your mob. <laughs> you know, it's your tribe. Who are your tribes? What are your tribes? You know, where do you find comfort? Where do you find support? Where do you find camaraderie? Uh, who are the people that you know are, you know, fellow fellow teammates in life that you can be particularly open to their beneficial feedback from? You know? Can you be grateful for that? For the communities, the friendship groups, um, even of different kinds that you've had along the way. Yeah. Then you might want to ask yourself, if you do bow, who or what are you bowing to? Are you, as I am, bowing to the other people here? At the end of the meditation, when I bow, I'm bowing to you, to you. I'm bowing to your practice, to your sincerity, to your presence, to your efforts along the way. And the fact that they are developing and are imperfect, like my own efforts, actually makes it even more honorable to bow to. Because if you were all, if you were already fully enlightened, you know, I could bow to that, but then you'd be already cooked, you already baked, you know, already fully realized. And I bow to your effort, to your application, to your openness, to your interest, to your trying. I bow to you. Who do you bow to? Also, in my own personal practice, um, another thing that I bow to is the mystery, the ultimate, the ultimate ground of all. Even the ground, very mysteriously, of the ground of all, of the Big Bang universe. That too, is that something that touches you? Is that something you can bow to? Uh, maybe just the universe, right? You look out and you see these pictures of galaxies and galaxies intertwining with each other. You, you have some knowledge through modern science that the universe has been banging along for nearly 14 billion years. So many things have had to happen before we got to be here today. So many things, so many strange coincidences, so many causes and conditions to have a human consciousness in this life. Wow, maybe that's what you're about to, the totality of the universe unfolding. Maybe you bow to a sense of the nature of this universe and the nature of all experiences also. The nature of all things and all thoughts is the same. Parts connected and changing continuously, thus empty of solidity and absolute self-existence. Things exist and thoughts exist emptily. Can you bow to that emptiness which creates an endless field of emergent possibility? Without emptiness, everything would freeze, come to a halt, and there would be no more becoming there'd be no more emerging. Maybe recognizing this conceptually and then coming into a mind-stopping, awestruck sense of that, bowing to the mystery. Also, another maybe not so conventional thing to um, bow to, if you like, are your former yous. The you a year ago who worked hard that day, put up with a fair amount of crud, I'm sure, coming at you from lots of directions, hung in there, tried hard, didn't get too crazy, didn't make too many catastrophic mistakes, actually probably did a lot of good that day, a lot of good that day, that gradually got handed off to the you the next day and then onward, onward, onward to you today. Similarly, you can look back over time and you know you can honor the imperfect, but still sincere and sustained, good-hearted on the whole, well-intended on the whole, steady on the whole, efforts of the previous use. 
Now, you know, if you're getting older, there are a lot of those yous. If you just think about one a day, you might look back and 20,000 plus yous all the way back in time. Thank you. Can you look back on that line? And instead of you know, having a fairly typical, critical, disappointed, well, yeah, but attitude, psh, just gratitude, just the gratitude part of, yeah, I look back, I see previous use of mine, fell short, cut a corner, were too impulsive, too angry, you know, too inebriated, too this, too that. All right. <laughs> Shame on you, maybe, or hey, there's something to learn you. But on the whole, wow, so many good use. Just focus on that part. What's that feel like? To thank those previous use who handed off the ball each day so you could hold it today and hand it off to the you you are becoming tomorrow. That is a bow. You know, in my own personal meditative practice, I offer three bows at the beginning and the end. And the first bow is to the infinite, the ultimate, the, div the divine, the ground of all. The second bow is to key teachers. And the third bow is to all kinds of other things that have supported me along the way, including the previous sincere efforts of myself. I do that not out of vanity, but out of respect and appreciation and a knowing that, you know, the I I am today is going to be the you that I tomorrow will be bowing to. And I want to be worthy of that bow. What bow from you tomorrow do you want to be worthy of today? Quite a powerful way to live your life. Quite a beautiful one, isn't it? And you don't need to be perfect. You don't need to have a halo to be worthy of that bow. Just what, what would another person have to, be have to be worthy of to deserve your bow? What would they have to do to be worthy of your bow? If you think of another person, you know, you just look at them in the aggregate and you think, wow, you are caring a lot. Just getting up out of bed in the morning is worth my bow. Just not being a total wanker. As you go through the day, given what's happened to you in this life, the disadvantages you face, the mistreatment you face, the, the pain you're carrying in your body, the things that have happened, the losses you've suffered, wow, boom, I bow to you for that. And, you know, beyond that, you're trying, you're helping, you're contributing, you're making effort, you're holding up your side of the log. That's worthy of my bow. You have a good heart. That's worthy of my bow. It doesn't have to be perfect. In much the same way, you know, what do you need to do today to be worthy of your bow tomorrow? And, you know, maybe that moves you to making a little extra effort, to being a little extra careful, to practicing a little extra deeply today to be worthy of those kind of bows tomorrow. So. I also want to speak to a kind of fundamental opportunity that can take us into a deep, deep kind of awakening when we start resting in gratitude. Because gratitude, with its aspects of opening and receptivity, tends to bring us experientially really into the reality of existence which has its two entwined fundamental features, which is that patterns are continually forming and dispersing continuously. The pattern of a particular thought, the pattern of a eddying of a cloud in the atmosphere, the pattern of a planet coalescing and then eventually being swallowed up as our planet will be by its own sun, which will eventually expand several billion years from now. Don't worry, it's not coming around the corner. Um, you know, one part of reality is that all patterns disperse. Every form, every thought and everything is a patterning of reality, 
a patterning of the ground. And so the patternings are endlessly changing. They're endlessly disappearing beneath our feet. And it's very poignant to be grateful for them as they pass away. Gratitude often makes us aware of things that are no longer here. People who are no longer here, events, lessons, insights, it's not here. Gratitude brings us into impermanence often. So we can both be aware of and live in one truth of forms of patterns occurring that are unstable and empty while the ground of all is utterly stable. It's always here. The ground of all is always here. It's not subject to arising and passing away. All forms, all patternings of the ground of all are subject to arising and passing away. That's the great teaching of the Buddha. Meanwhile, there is this ongoingness of reality, this ongoingness of the ground of all. And something about gratitude can bring us more and more deeply into those two truths. And with a grateful heart, we can be brave enough to relax our clinging to forms that are continually changing. We don't need to hold on to them because with gratitude, we can realize how buoyed we are, how supported we are, how, how lived we are by so many things, which also helps us realize that eventually when our own patterning our own eddy in the streaming of reality disperses, we will simply disperse out back into the sea of everything that was our nature all along. And gratitude can be a path that draws you into this opening of the heart that eventually can open out into everything. And then with that kind of faith, you can kawoosh, fall back, fall back into the ground of everything, the reality of everything with confidence and relax and live your life. The last words of the Buddha are very skillfully translated by Stephen Batchelor. As, as best we know, the Buddha turning to his students, his friends, his comrades, and saying to them, things fall apart, tread your path with care. Things fall apart, they do. Everything eventually falls apart. That's one part of the truth. The other part of the truth is that we can tread our own path with conscientiousness and heart, two aspects of care, including, as we tread it, that growing recognition of the ongoingness, the reliability and the refuge of the underlying ground of all. Tread your path with care, for things fall apart. With gratitude and faith along the way. Okay, I am very grateful to you, and I'm grateful to our stewards. This is a collection of over a dozen people, wonderful people who help make this all happen. I'm very grateful to you. Uh, I'm grateful to the technology that enables all this, and I'm grateful, very grateful to my many teachers from many different traditions who have, you know, I feel like um, I'm a dynamic unfolding kind of braiding, a braiding of all those various strands, you know, weaving us all today. Well, that was a lot. I hope it was helpful to you. All right, you know, I really invite you into an ongoing practice of gratitude. Gobsmacked with gratitude is a heck of a way to meet the day and to return to that as a refuge uh, for you, you know, when you're upset by something or worried about something or just running around with your hair on fire because that's what you got to do for a while to take care of some things. Okay, but as soon as you can, coming back to, wow, 
Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. It's a good practice. Okay. So let's see. I see things that are people offering um, in the chat as things they're grateful for. And be clear sometimes that when something maybe another person is grateful for, you may not be grateful for. That's okay. That's what for them is a valuable gift they've received. I know, you know, it's all fine. Um, and also maybe there are things that you'll see that, oh, yeah, that too, I could be grateful for. I'm grateful for whoever figured out buttons, you know, and like a shirt. I'm I'm weirdly grateful for paper clips. Like who in the world figured out paper clips? What? Right? You know, <laughs> all these weird little things you look around like, whoa. <laughs> I'm grateful. I'm weird. You know, I like straight lines. I don't know if you can see the straight lines on my yellow pad, but you know, trust me, they're straight lines. Like someone made those lines. They're all straight. I like it. They're all straight. Parallel lines. Yes. Thank you. Anyway. Okay. So let me just take a quick. Uh, so Jesse Ryan asked me a question at 710. Is the path of love that you've talked about as being a spiritual path in and of itself? Is gratitude part of that path or different? Um, I've spoken of, in the history of Buddhism, some scholarship that suggests that the Buddha, then you judge it on its merits, that the Buddha said that love, the opening of the heart, is itself a potentially thoroughly complete path of full enlightenment. Now, along the way with heart comes, of course, inside practices of virtue. Um, you know, we can have a very loving heart, but if we're not able to kind of regulate ourselves and how we function in this world. It's hard to stabilize things for full awakening. So it really all works together. And I think that what gratitude does do is it does draw us into the heart. Uh, we can be certainly grateful for paper clips. <laughs> I don't know how much that opens the heart. But as soon as I start thinking about key people or pets, um, wow, bingo really opens the heart. Okay. Well, I see a couple of people, um, and I'm going to definitely get to you in a minute here. Any particular question or comments? It's really okay. Um, great. By the way, Joy Curlin brings in at 11 minutes past the hour this wonderful bit, you know, little teaching from Anne Lamott, who's really quite a being and an extraordinary writer. Anne Lamott said, three prayers would be enough. Where are we? Help, wow, and thank you. All right? Help, wow, thank you. Yeah, it's great. Okay. Great, great, great. Uh, well, okay, how about Heather and then Catherine? All right, so I'm gonna ask you to unmute, Heather. Great, and as usual, I always say this, Heather, it's not personal. Try to ask a question that's succinct and focused on what we've talked about tonight. Okay, go for it. Sure, I was wondering if you could speak to being appreciative to pain, illness, and even suffering mm. itself for the wisdom that it brings. Um, that's been my experience in my life. Um, but on the, you know, that's, I'm sure not the only feelings I have towards those things, yeah. but um, speaking to that and then the goal of helping others to mm -hmm. really reduce their pain and suffering in their life. But, you know, again, also being appreciative of it, appreciative of it, maybe in a sense that helping them before it, it, it needs to be an extreme amount of pain and suffering is maybe what I'm getting at but mm. being able to be appreciative of those things. Well, Heather, I really mean what I'm about to say. Thank you for your teaching. You said it, you really said it. Um, thank you for your teaching here. And it's absolutely true. You, you may know the metaphor, perhaps reality of the so-called four divine messengers in the Buddha's own journey as a young man toward his own awakening, in which he encountered supposedly stepping out of his life of privilege and advantage and wealth and power. Um, he encountered uh, someone who was dead, someone who was ill, and someone who was old. Those are three. And they were divine messengers. They were 
divine in some sense. You know, they were from the gods in some sense. They were things to, they were teachings. They were beings to be grateful to, kind of along the lines of what you're saying. And there was the fourth messenger, someone who was a dedicated practitioner of healing, growing, and awakening. That was the fourth messenger. But three out of four, you know, 75% of the messengers are, as you say, you know, involve pain and suffering. And so, yeah, absolutely. I think we can, in a funny kind of way, be grateful to what we've learned the, you know, from the hardest things in our life. And it's not that we're trying to look on the bright side or turn a blind eye, um, as you well know, uh, to the hard parts, but you know, we can be grateful for and appreciative of the ways that these have maybe opened our heart, drawn us into community with others. When my parents passed away, 10 years apart, that really helped me feel more connected with people who'd had a serious, a major loss in their life. I hadn't had uh, someone major in my life die before that. Uh, physical pain opens us up into realizing so many people uh, who, you know, who've had pain. You really can appreciate it as a teacher. So yeah, so thank you for really naming that, for really, really naming that. And then often when we open to, in a funny kind of way, I think implicit in what you said, is if we feel grateful for our own pain, you know, in a weird kind of way, we're even more moved to try to relieve pain in other people. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for your teaching. Really. Okay, Catherine River Rain, I'm asking you to unmute. There you are. Hi, Rick. Hey there. <clears throat> well, I'm I'm grateful I found you and um, oh. that you give us such great grounded guidance and access to talking to you. Yeah. <laughs> it's helped me. Good. And Thank you. I'm strangely grateful for the pandemic too, which I should qualify, but I actually am because I just, I could feel that we were on this speedy trajectory, even if I was part of it, hmm. benefiting from it, but it's something didn't feel right about it. And, and even though it was shocking, I was actually grateful to have the cocoon to come back within that I, I was finding it very hard to go within despite all the things that I was doing. So, but what I wanted to ask you to weigh in on, if you don't mind, is, um, you know, there's excessive focus in the spiritual communities or wellness or yoga of gratitude. And it just so often rings hollow, you know, uh -huh. like a by like a bypass. Uh -huh. yeah. And I find it's pretty hard to language it or bring it up to people in a way that it doesn't feel like, yeah, that's nice because they're, they're not, they're not there yet. And it's so like when the other Heather mentioned pain, I mean, you take someone who's in pain, who doesn't understand how it could be helpful or grateful to it. And you tell them, be grateful for it. And it's like, you just, people just want to not the one. So I just wonder like, how can you, <laughs> how can you do like a half step? So it doesn't feel inauthentic, you know? help people yeah so we have two situations right so um <clears throat> someone's in pain and or maybe they're just really caught up in something and let's suppose even that it's well intended to kind of start drawing them to that second step of the three steps you know deal with the bad turn to the good take in the good right um, and you're thinking of how to do that or flip it around you're the person who's in the middle of something and dealing with a messy situation and some person, well-intended or not, says stuff like, well, look on the, every cloud has a silver lining. Or if you can't see anything nice, don't see anything at all. Da, 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 da. Or be grateful to your abusive parent who taught you blah, blah, blah. I mean, uh, uh, that kind of, it's pretty hard to go there for most of us, right? I think. No, 100%, 100%. I'll tell you, one thing I'm really grateful for myself as a way into this is the people who just shut up and listened to me <laughs> for like three minutes in a row. Wow, 180 seconds. You know, there's this wonderful Mr. Rogers moment. You may have seen it. If you haven't, I highly recommend it, where he receives a lifetime award in the Emmys. I think this is a YouTube clip from the 1980s. And in it, and it, I won't spoil it, but basically there's a moment in it where he asks for 10 seconds of silence. 
And that 10 seconds lasts a long time. It's quite something for, for another person to listen for 180 seconds. Just listen, right? So you know, one of the great gifts we can give to people is to truly be present with their pain and to really let them talk, to let them get it off their chest, to hear the whole story, ask more about it, really try to understand how it landed on them. Sort out impact from intent. Maybe the intent of some of the players in their life were neutral or even positive. Okay, I got it. But what was the impact, including the socially situated, class, race, all kinds of stuff, gender dynamics and so forth, of the events that have happened? You know, slow down and really receive that. So I think that's a really important thing to do. And um, to give other people that kind of deep listening and even ask for it. You know, hey, before you jump to what I ought to do about it or what I ought to be grateful about, could you have a large enough heart here and now, please, to really receive what I'm saying here? You know, which might even be about them, right? So I think that's a very important point. And then we know there's a lot of details about that. But the essence of is to really, what are we bowing to? Have we really bowed to the first three messengers adequately? Have we bowed to the upset? Have we bowed to the sorrow? Have we bowed to the vulnerabilities this landed on in that other person? You know, have we bowed to that? That's, I find, really important. And in a funny kind of way, it's a low bar if you're the listener. Like, it's not that hard to shut up. <laughs> you know, just listen. It's okay. You know, it's just, right, I'm not talking hours. I'm talking a handful of minutes here. And to listen deeply without an agenda, without formulating your rebuttals, your counterattacks, just receive, right? It's, it's kind of a low bar. It okay. takes people a lot longer, it seems now, to feel acknowledged. Like, yeah, we all have such a short attention span. Like, you'd be listening, listening, listening quite a number of times before it sinks in. Like, oh, they heard me. And then maybe they want to reframe some gratitude. Yeah. It's like quite a long process, right? That's, that's on our side of the street. If we are deeply listened to, but my personal experience a lot is that when they're actually Israel listening, not via text, because how do you listen via text? You know, maybe you can listen on Zoom or on the telephone, but there's real listening. Uh, you know, when there's real listening, we kind of feel it. Okay, so that's part one. Then I'll keep moving here. Uh, part two, I think a lot is, um, you know, to just not shift until it feels right. But, you know, when it does feel right, okay, make that shift. Recognize what is also true. And I, I think you're right. There is a tendency toward a spiritual bypass for leaping on the one hand. On the other hand, frankly, I've seen a lot of counter tendencies to that. Uh, people who are so afraid of um, spiritual bypassing or not really being fully present with all their pain that they just, they're inert, they're passive about it. They don't engage wise effort, you know, that dimension of the Eightfold Path. So both things true. Did you want to say a little more about that? Maybe, and then we'll move on. Yeah, no, that's very interesting, yeah. Um, well, I, I just think this holding space is one of the most important things and it's hard to, it's hard to do it sometimes and it's hard yeah. to have it our, come our way. So I, I'm grateful that you do it for us. Oh, oh, my pleasure, you know. Uh, <laughs> people have held a lot of space for me along the way. So let me just double check a few things uh, that have come in on the chat so far. And thank you, Catherine. So then I also want to say something else that came in kind of quickly uh, about feeling humbled that came in from Ma Margaret at, uh, let's see, 22 minutes after the hour. Uh, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that, Margaret in terms of feeling humbled, uh, what I'm saying myself, I think, is that, you know, there's a kind of humility that recognizes dependence. And in Western culture that is hyper-individualistic and independent, people can really bristle at the recognition of their own dependence upon others. Uh, to put it in a little bit of context that may have a certain ring to you, uh, 
I don't know when it was during President Obama's, I think, second term or so, maybe first term. At one point, he was talking about business owners who relied upon a whole deep infrastructure, uh, reaching back hundreds of years even in the larger development of America. And he was saying to them, you didn't build that yourself. You know, you didn't install the public highway system. You didn't build the interstate train system. You didn't establish the internet yourself. Like anyone, you rely on these many, many social goods for the opportunity to make a profit. And I believe in market economies and, you know, I'm a, in business myself. There's a place for that. Uh, but whatever success we have in our business or in our career, that depends on a vast network of other of other beings. And that can be hard sometimes. He got Dr. Uh, President Obama, <laughs> Dr. Obama, President Obama got a lot of blowback for that comment from the right, but it's perfectly true. And it's important to recognize it. Another thing is to appreciate the ways that so much of what we enjoy in this life um, has been taken unjustly from other people. Whether it's uh, the lives and the suffering of non-human animals that we consume, factory farming, uh, the native people who walked the land that was taken from them. Um, you know, we, most of us at least, uh, live and function on unceded land. It was not given, it was taken. Uh, I've enjoyed a variety of advantages in my life that existed through disadvantaging others. Structural advantages through being white in America, male, heterosexual, etc. cetera. Um, you know, those are advantages. Unearned advantages exist through disadvantaging others. We live in that, in that larger web. And at a minimum, we can recognize this and, and have a kind of humility about it and offer our respects and our gratitude and then really look hard at how we can make reparations, how we can repair, how we can do what we can to pay back others broadly for the you know unjust advantages that we've been given through disadvantaging them. I mean, that's really something to look hard at, right? In a clear-eyed kind of way. Uh, in what small way can you take the steps that you can toward making, you know, rectifying or righting so many vast wrongs, knowing that what you do will be very small in comparison to those vast wrongs, but still there's a sincerity in your own effort. Uh, yeah. Okay. Let's see. Well, lots of great comments coming in on the chat. Maybe I'll just leave it alone. Uh, you know, I see wonderful comments coming in. As you may know, we have breakout rooms. I see Rochelle. Okay, last person. Rochelle, if I'm pronouncing that properly. Okay, Rochelle, uh, succinctly. Yeah, please. The pressure's on. I don't know if, I guess this, I didn't mean to um, uh, connect visually so or this way. I was trying to... Um, get the transcript to uh aha uh -huh. i see okay stay and i'm i'm yeah i just kind of flubbed up there you pushed the wrong I'll button this, no worries I pushed the wrong button however i will take this yeah. opportunity to say how grateful i am to be part of this wednesday uh, night meditation thank yeah. you oh it's a blessing you know for me honestly it's huge really and um that said, I really do appreciate your gratitude. And maybe my, my last offering could be how important it is actually to receive the thanks of others. It's their gift. It's their gift. And it's so easy sometimes to be embarrassed by it or to kind of, you know, a little false modesty. Oh, shucks, not really. Or, to, or maybe you don't want to receive their gift because then you feel like you'll owe them something in turn. And yet if we obstruct the flow of their giving, we obstruct the flow of generosity broadly. And generosity uh, is such a crucially important thing and one that certainly in the Buddhist tradition is highly honored, highly honored. Uh, so we, it's important to enable the generosity of others by receiving their generosity, right? And not being so big and so full already or so self-sufficient that you don't need anything from anyone else. Right, right. 
Well, so thank you. I think I think this, this the simplicity of just um, being validated by other people. Yeah, it's it's a huge huge gift. So thank you. Yeah, thank and, you. And I give my thanks to all you've done. Oh, good. Well, good. Okay, so finishing up in this week to come, you know, you might explore to your, for yourself a couple of things. First, thinking about moving through your day with, as they say, an attitude of gratitude, not as a spiritual bypass, not as someone who's becoming a, a, you know, easily exploited by others, but just repeatedly throughout your day. You might even put up little reminders. What can I be grateful for now? You know, every time you notice that that, that the hour has changed, or you, you know, have a meal. What could I be grateful for today? Upon what does my life depend that I can be thankful for? What gives me my living, my loving, my enjoying, my knowing, my awakening that I can be thankful for, large and small, just on the fly? That's a good practice. Another one is to really explore what I was saying there at the end, the possibility of Using gratitude as a way to draw yourself into the arising of the present in a way that helps you appreciate both the emptiness, the frothy, dynamic, transient emptiness of all forms, all thoughts and all things in the present, while also, ah, because you've been given so much, you can really also recognize the stability of the ground of all into which you can let go and fall back and open out and become. So both gratitude for a lot of little things maybe in the flow of the day and a grateful, surrendered faith in the ultimate that is the ground in which we all live. That's my suggestion for you. Take good care. You're really beautiful. Uh, may you have beautiful days. May all that you love may, may live and prosper. And may all beings live and prosper as well. So I'll see you next week. And I look forward to it. Take good care. Bye-bye.